Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining all of us today. My name is Dr. Vivek Murthy, and I'm honored to serve as the Surgeon General of the United States. In my role, I'm charged with looking out for the health and well-being of each and every American. And I consider this to be a sacred responsibility, particularly in this grave moment, when we're living through a once-in-a-century pandemic. Now, I know we're here because we all know that COVID-19 has caused tremendous suffering for millions of Americans. Many of us have lost family members to this virus. I myself have lost seven, uh, including my uncle Roman earlier this year. Many of us have also felt what it's like to be worried sick about your loved ones getting COVID, especially family members of ours who are elderly or who might work on the front lines. You know, over this past year, every time my father and my sister went to work in their medical practice, I couldn't help but fear that this was the day that they were going to be exposed to the virus. Mm. And during the pandemic, people have also lost many other things, jobs, the chance to go go to school, the possibility of holding loved ones close. The fact that this pandemic has also affected some people far more than others has also underscored the profound racial and geographic disparities in health that have long plagued our nation. But despite the heavy toll that COVID has exacted, this pandemic has also reminded us of a fundamental truth, that we need each other, that our happiness Mm. and our survival and depend on our connection to one another and our community. You know, during this past year, even as COVID separated us physically, so many people stepped up to help one another, delivering food to neighbors who were too worried to go to the grocery store, checking in on friends who were having a hard time, putting their own lives at risk to provide medical care in hospitals, to keep grocery stores open, and to keep our neighborhoods safe. That spirit of community is what makes our country great. And it is what we need now more than ever as we seek to bring this pandemic to an end. Now we're all here today because all of you have agreed to be founding members of the COVID-19 Community Corps, a nationwide grassroots network of leaders who are stepping up to protect your communities. And together our goal is to help our communities get vaccinated and by doing so to stop the spread of COVID-19. Now, I know that we've made great progress on the vaccination front, but even though nearly 100 million Americans have already received at least one shot, there are still millions of Americans who are not protected against the virus. But your leadership has the power to change that. Collectively, you can reach out to millions of people with the facts about COVID and the COVID vaccine. And this is so important because hearing the facts from trusted sources is what will help people make good decisions about their health. And that's why I firmly believe that your involvement will save lives. And it's why all of us are so grateful to you for being a community core leader. Now, as we begin our conversation today, and as we embark on this work together, I'm also reminded that this initiative is, has been made possible by the hardworking men and women of the administration who are committed to addressing COVID with the power of science and compassion and partnership. That commitment starts at the very top. Having champions in the White House for public health is absolutely essential. And that is why I am so honored today to introduce one of our nation's most important leaders, one who has broken barriers and lifted up communities, a leader who is kind and strong and who has inspired millions of people including my son and daughter, who took to calling her Kamala Auntie from the very first time they saw her picture. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Surgeon General Murthy. Um, and I just, in front of all of the friends who are here, um, I just have to tell you, he has been tireless. Um, for months and months working on this issue. And so in front of everyone, I wanna thank you, Vivek, for all you have been doing um, to lift us up as a nation and to also lift up uh, the importance of following the science and and the fact that we are in this together. And so lifting up the the power and significance of the, the collective. 
And so to everyone, thank you. Good morning. I know it's very early for all of the friends on the West Coast. And um, to all of you, thank you for, for joining for this first meeting, this inaugural meeting of, of our community core. And um, we are truly very excited about um, the, the participation and the collaboration and the coalition building potential of this group of leaders. And, um, and I'll tell you, when we look at the number of vaccines that are being administered each week, um, they are increasing and that gives us a sense of optimism. Uh, we are breaking records all of the time. Our goal of 100 million shots in 100 days is now 200 million shots in 100 days. And by April 19th, nine in 10 adults in the United States will be eligible to sign up for a shot. And we want, and the president feels very strongly about this, we want every adult in the United States to sign up and get vaccinated when they can and when it's their turn, because that's what will make us strong. And that's what will make us healthy and get us through this pandemic. And so this is what we're here to discuss. And again, thank you all for for taking the call to be part of this. Um, around this virtual table, we have some of the most trusted leaders in the United States. I've got a big screen here where I can see everyone. I hope you all can see each other. Uh, we can just let's wave. <laughs> Uh, what a collection. Um, we have community leaders, we have faith leaders, we have union leaders, we have business leaders, 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 leaders. And, um, and we know that the people of our country look to leaders like you, and they have been looking to you. They have been looking in your eyes, searching to, to believe that there should be a reason to have hope. They have been looking in your eyes and looking to you to give them some confidence that we can get through this and give them a sense of knowing that they are not alone. This is what you all have been doing over the course of this last year. And you, of course, are leaders that are leaders in your communities. Um, you are the people that folks on the ground know and rely on and have a history with. And when people are then making a decision to get vaccinated, they're going to look to you. They're going to look to you to, to help answer the questions that they may have that may include what's in the vaccine. It may also include how do I sign up? How do I get there? The transportation piece. And so that's why today, as part of our broader public education campaign, we are launching our COVID-19 Community Corps. And so everyone, as the Surgeon General has said, everyone gathered here is a founding member. And, and I thank you on behalf of myself and President Biden for stepping up. Um, this is a really important moment. And we have a great opportunity at this moment. And as we all know, each day is not equal. We are at a phase where with the increasing number of supply of vaccinations, we are at a phase at this moment where we can actually get a hold of this thing and advance where we want to be as a country in terms of protecting um, our neighbors. And so as members, you will have access to the latest information and a host of resources that you can then share with those you serve. And we will work with you to get creative and we want your ideas about how we can be most creative to be most effective. Uh, through our Share the Mic program, for instance, we can set up a Q&A, a question and answer with a doctor or a, nur a nurse on your platforms. This work couldn't be more important. And as we know, our public health professionals are some of the most trusted in terms of a source of information about what is in the vaccine and how it works. Um, but here's the other truth that we must speak. In some communities, some of our hardest hit communities, it's too hard to access the vaccine or get information about it. And we have to be honest about that. We certainly are. Um, we have to be honest that in some communities there is a concern about getting vaccinated. Some based on mistrust, based on history. Some based um, on just rooted in misinformation of which there is a lot out there and we need your help to combat that. Um, and so these are, the, these are some of the concerns that people have. And these are, these are fair concerns which we must address. Um, but no matter the community, trusted leaders are the best way to boost confidence. And trusted leaders, you, are the best way to deliver information. 
Uh, you know, yesterday I actually convened a group of faith leaders from around the country, and they were very clear. Um, they said, look, sometimes people just need basic information, you know? I mean, you're asking people to take a shot in the arm. They need, they need to know what's going on. They need to know things like what's in the vaccine? How does it work? Um, and they need to hear from the people they trust. And again, that is you. And so that's why we are investing the bulk of our time in resources in this group of leaders and you, um, who are the trusted leaders of America. Last week, we announced that we're investing nearly $10 billion in grants to community organizations, to health centers, and local governments to help build confidence and increase access to the vaccine. And with our community core, we will empower more leaders with more information to reach more people. So you kind of get the theme here. We need to do more, and we need your help to do it. Um, whether you run a faith-based organization that's going door to door to schedule appointments, which so many of you have been doing, or a food assistance program that's making sure that folks have transportation to vaccination sites, or a community health center doing the beautiful, culturally competent work, the bilingual health outreach, speaking to people in the language they speak, literally and culturally. And the basic message, of course, we all know, is, is pretty straightforward. The vaccine is safe, and it will save lives. The vaccine is safe, and it will save lives. And so the community core is about getting that message out as far and as wide as we possibly can. And you know, um, I've been I've been calling our broad public education campaign the "We Can Do This" campaign um, because I do believe I know and I have faith that we can do this. And so, with your help, let's do it. And I look forward to hearing from you um, about what you are doing, how it is going, how we might help you scale your good work. And again, you know, this has been a moment of great crisis, as, as our Surgeon General has said, great loss, um, loss of life, loss of jobs, loss of normalcy for our, our children, loss of very significant phases of their educational process. And um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We are now, you know, we are, we're in spring. I'm here in D.C., and I just got a peek at the cherry blossoms blooming. And, um, and around the world, regardless of your faith or where you might be, this is a, a time where we celebrate renewal and hope. And I'm very much feeling that, and I know we are collectively feeling that, but we have to then couple our hope and our faith with action. Because that's the only way we will achieve all that we hope to achieve and gain. And so that, again, brings me back to you. Because you are people of action. And we are so honored to have you join us. And so now we're going to hear from several of our community core founding members. And the first is I'm introducing Dr. Reed Tuxen of the Black Coalition Against COVID. Dr. Tuxen. Well, thank you so much. And good morning, Madam Vice President and Surgeon General Murphy. The Black Coalition Against COVID is pleased and privileged to be included in this timely and essential initiative. Our work began on Easter Sunday of last year in recognition of the devastation that would inevitably be experienced by the Black community from the then growing pandemic. As a former commissioner of public health for Washington, D.C., during the height of the AIDS epidemic in the mid 80s, I learned firsthand the essential importance of mounting grassroots campaigns to partner with and support the work of governments. As such, we reached out and engaged the steering committee that enabled us to reach into almost every aspect of DC community life and engage key influencers whose voices had credibility and resonance. These included leaders from communities such as uh, community-based organizations, faith, organized labor, small business, musicians, poets, visual artists, actors, domestic abuse workers, returning incarcerated citizens, physical, mental, and public health professionals, substance abuse experts, social workers, and of course, the Howard University academic community, among others. Our efforts then and now are devoted to raising awareness of compliance with the best scientific and up-to-date guidance on mask wearing, physical distancing, hand washing, and avoiding congregating indoors. As we confronted though, Madam Vice President, the challenges of gaining acceptance for participation in vaccine-related clinical trials, 
we broaden our team by adding a specific health coalition comprised by the presidents of the four historically black medical schools, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, and Charles Drew, along with the National Medical Association and the National Black Nurses Association. We augmented this team with the National Urban League and the largest digital publisher of health information for the black community, blackdoctor.org. Together, we have produced numerous uh, what we call making it plain national town halls for the black community generally, and many targeted at specific subcommunities, such as a recent one with almost all of our major fraternal, social, and political organizations that reached 700,000 people. Another, which was, I'm sure, near to your heart, uh, Madam Vice President, we did with Sisters United for Reform, which reached 250,000 Black women. And another one that we did just recently with the Congressional Black Caucus. Through the course of our work, we've been continually impressed by the opportunities inherent in collaboration. As, the, as Surgeon General Murthy said, in this time of crisis, there has been an incredible outpouring of goodwill. And we've benefit, benefited from collaborations with senior federal leaders in your administration, particularly at the CDC, as we've worked with them to foster a more clear and dynamic role for community-based and faith-based organizations in vaccine administration. But we've also been able to work with faith community leaders, such as those running Choose Healthy Life, the Values Partnership, Black Ideas Initiative, and the AME Council of Bishops. We've worked with media companies and content producers, such as Real Chemistry, CMR, Joy Collective and the Ad Council, the Kaiser Family Foundation, and YouTube and Google. Other companies have come to our aid, such as the Boston Consulting Group, Bio, Pharma, Henry Schein, and the Made to Save. In closing, Madam VP and Surgeon General Murthy, we believe our work is having an impact because we uh, use blackdoctor.org, which has a great ability to do polling. And we can tell that the polling over the last several months has flipped from 70% negative in the black community wanting to take the vaccine to now down to 28%. Uh, and we know that the people in the middle are definitely reachable. We see April as the critical month in this flat out race to the finish line. And so we are doubling down on all of our work. We'll be working with all of our partners to produce major events at least once a week along with numerous other local DC community-based activities. We're especially interested in realizing the benefits of our developing partnership with young creative entrepreneurs, such as Jaron Smith and Chris Holiday, who have deep creative connections with our athletes and music celebrities. We have to focus much more intently on their audiences of young people who need to receive science-based and relevant information from black medical experts that are filtered through engagements with the people that they pay attention to. Madam Vice President and Surgeon General Murthy, you have the full support of the Black Coalition Against COVID as you and leaders such as Marcella Nunez-Smith and Cameron Webb and others in your administration move us forward. Madam Vice President, we can do this. Yes, we can. Thank you, Dr. Tuxin. And, you know, I, as I was listening to you and, and, and your, your campaign about making it plain, you know, what is, what is also clear to me about this moment of crisis is that there is the opportunity to reintroduce and, and remind folks of what is available to them in their community by way of public health assistance and health care. Um, and we should think about this that way, because it is about first and immediately, and like you said, April is a critical month, so it is immediately about the vaccines. But it can also be a conversation that reminds folks of what is available to them in their community health centers, in their, in their community-based organizations to get them access to health care for all of the other needs that they have. And so... That's where I see a great opportunity. And again, this is a moment where this crisis gives me hope that we can potentially leapfrog over the, the COVID issue into a place where we also accelerate getting people access to the overall health care they need. Because in many ways, I think that this pandemic has been an accelerator um, for, the, for those for whom things were bad before, they're even worse now. But if we can see it as also an opportunity to accelerate into a better place than we were even before, um, our work will be worth it. And I think it's the, it's the leapfrogging concept. Yes. It's also yes. building the bridge. That's right. So that what we are creating is, a, and it's funny because this is what you and the president are doing. Yeah. We're building an infrastructure. That's right. And that if we build it right, That's right. and we build it with an eye to the future, yeah. then we will not lose what we built in the pandemic. That's exactly but it will right. But sustain us in the future. Exactly. Making it plain. <laughs> 
And next, I am excited to introduce Neil Bradley um, from the United States Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Neil, for joining us. Well, Madam Vice President, Dr. Uh, Murphy, uh, thank you so much. On behalf of the U.S. Chamber, uh, we want to applaud your leadership throughout this pandemic, but also today in launching this COVID-19 Community Corps. Um, you know, across the United States, since the beginning of the pandemic, businesses of all sizes across all sectors have been honored to answer the nation's call, whether that was converting their operations in the early days to make PPE and hand sanitizer and ventilators, or whether it was the frontline companies who kept our country going in some of its darkest hours, or the telecommunication companies who've made meetings like this today possible, and of course our pharmaceutical industry, which developed a vaccine uh, from inception to deployment in record time. Uh, but Madam Vice President, as you noted, we're in a different phase now, and American businesses are pleased to answer the call in this phase. They are ready to step forward, whether that's uh, offering vaccination sites on their own properties or in their own facilities, or getting basic information to their employees and to their customers, providing paid time off so that individuals can go to the pharmacy, can go to a doctor, can go to one of your mass vaccination sites to receive this vaccine. Uh, a few weeks ago, we launched something called the Rally for Recovery at the U.S. Chamber. We've signed up nearly 400 employers that collectively employ over 4 million Americans. And they all took a pledge to do their part, to do the things that I just mentioned, to make sure that we get as many Americans vaccinated as quickly as possible. And that as soon as someone's vaccine is available to them, that they know how to get it. I'm confident, and we're confident at the U.S. Chamber, that with this new initiative that you've launched, that together, working collectively, we can reach every business, irrespective of size, and reach down to every main street in America. Across the United States today, there are hundreds of state and local chambers of commerce who are itching and excited to bring this pandemic to a close. They're ready to do our, their part, and collectively, I think we can do this. So I wanna echo uh, Dr. Tuxen, uh, together, uh, we can get this done. Uh, who is echoing you, Madam Vice President? And we are uh, we are honored to be a part of this today. And you can count us in to do everything in our power to support you, to support the administration, and to end this pandemic. That's fantastic. Thank you, Neil. And um, please express our thanks also to all of those business leaders who have stepped up to, in particular, offer paid sick leave so that they're employees can go and get vaccinated because we don't want our workforce to have to choose between earning the money that they need to feed their kids with and getting a vaccine. So thank you and, and please pass on our thanks to your members. Um, next, we have Mary Kay Henry, the great leader of SEIU. Hey, Mary Kay. Thank you so much, Madam Vice President and Surgeon General Vivek Murphy. The two million members of SEIU are so proud to join with the rest of the nation in creating this COVID-19 community core. We're so encouraged um, with the leadership you've de demonstrated, Madam Vice President and Surgeon General Vivek Murphy, with taking command, even in the transition, uh, to your administration of creating a nationally coordinated plan to crush this virus through bold action that we just witnessed in the passage of the American Rescue Plan and in the announcement of the American Jobs Plan yesterday. We're proud to stand with you in fighting for the hardest hit communities to have equitable access to this vaccine. And at SEIU and across the labor movement, we are doing our part to educate our members, the essential workers who have kept our country running throughout the pandemic. And we're fighting to make sure they have access to the vaccine. As trusted messengers, here's what we've done, just as a sample of what we hope to contribute to the community core to make sure SEIU members have the information they need to protect themselves and their families from the spread of this deadly virus. We've held over 100 town halls 
in nine languages. The most recent one was in Cantonese with 90 member leaders who are connected to tens of thousands more with a trusted Cantonese physician uh, who was able to break through the misinformation and build trust. SEIU has even held pop-up clinics from coast to coast where thousands of members have been vaccinated. For home care workers in Washington and Oregon, for janitors and security officers in California, in Connecticut, Michigan, Maryland, and New York and New Jersey, we've partnered with nursing home employers, both employers who are union and employers who are non-union that are that want the partnership in order to get every nursing home worker and resident vac vaccinated to hold education sessions and clinics in skilled nursing facilities. Through our own polling, we've seen how these education and outreach efforts have given essential workers, black, brown, Asian, native, immigrant, and white, the information and facts they need to make the decision to get vaccinated and stop the spread. Sylvia Liang, who is a home care worker in Seattle, Washington, is just one example. She's 64 years old, but didn't plan on getting the vaccine until her client was also eligible. But it was seeing her fellow in-home caregivers get vaccinated and share their stories on social media that made the difference for her. After she got vaccinated, she was so grateful that the whole process was easy because of her union. Sylvia got her vaccine during an in-home caregiver pop-up clinic mm. that was a partnership between the city of Seattle and SEIU 775, our Washington State Caregivers Union. We are doing this across the country. Our clinics nationwide are on track to vaccinate 200,000 people by mid-April. We have the potential to do this at a much larger scale. I believe, Madam Vice President, that's why you've asked us to serve as part of the COVID-19 community core. And we're eager to partner with you and all the White House and with the Chamber of Commerce and the Black Coalition Against COVID and all the other partners gathered today so that we can ensure that every essential worker has access to the vaccine and that we prioritize those who are putting their lives on the line. The health of our nation depends on how we protect one another, regardless of the color of our skin, our ethnicity, or income. And we're ready to work with all of you to pull through this pandemic together and make sure that all essential workers are respected, protected, and paid what they're worth. Thank you so much for including us. Thank you, Mary Kay. And please, on behalf of all of us, thank your members, those essential workers who, from the beginning of this pandemic, were going to work, often taking public transportation, yes. um, without the equipment that they needed to be um, to be sure that they could be safe, but out of their commitment to caring for, for strangers often, um, they kept going to work, exposing themselves and their family to harm, but their commitment to the health and well-being of um, our country has been extraordinary. And so please, on behalf of all of us, thank them for their they work. They know you see them, Madam Vice President. They've received your phone calls on Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah. and being grateful yeah. for their service. We're, and Vivek included one of our registered nurses in the task force before inauguration. We're very, very grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. And next, it is my joy to introduce Zippy Duval, who is with the American Farm Bureau Federation. Zippy, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Vice President Harris and Surgeon General Murphy. Uh, we want to thank you for the invitation for us to join you in promoting the health in our communities. We appreciate the effort that this administration, as, uh, as our uh, nation continues to fight against this pandemic. American Farm Bureau is made up of 6 million members across this country. Uh, we have 2,800 active county Farm Bureau. So you want to talk about grassroots and, and working <laughs> from our communities. We are one of those organizations that can put forth some positive information about this. But early on in this pandemic, American Farm Bureau worked with our members across all 50 states and Puerto Rico to make sure that our farmers were aware of the best practices to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. It is important to Farm Bureau that our farmers and our employees have priority access 
to the vaccine, given the important role that we play on the front lines of our food supply. Now that the vaccine supply is ramping up, we look forward to the next step, which is addressing the barriers yeah. uh, uh, that uh, to receiving the vaccine and making sure that folks understand that the vaccine is safe and effective. We recognize that there are still some concerns around the vaccine, and we are working with our state farm bureaus to address these concerns, and we are leading by example. I was grateful to get my first dose recently, and I wrote an op-ed about the experience and the importance of these efforts to getting our country and our, or, and our industry to the other side of this pandemic. I've heard, of, uh, I've heard encouraging reports from our Farm Bureau leaders and our members across the organization who are not only getting their vaccines, but they're bringing their employees along with them mm -hmm. to get their vaccine. Our state Farm Bureaus are finding opportunities to share stories uh, about the, our leaders uh, and, and their members promoting the vaccination in rural areas. For example, just last week, North Carolina Farm Bureau President Sean Harding, who is a farmer, uh, shared a video documenting his vaccine experience as part of his State Farm Bureau's larger efforts to promote farmer and employee vaccination and awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, another Farm Bureau leader in Idaho, Stephanie McNicholson, uh, hosted a vaccine clinic at her farm for her employees. This is just one, a couple little snapshots of a many, many efforts that are being documented by my staff that's going on all across America uh, at our Farm Bureau, County Farm Bureau level to protect uh, our workforce. We urge the, the White House and our states to continue to bolster vaccine supply. And Farm Bureau is committed to bring, uh, play an important uh, part in the solution. Uh, we are we want to promote the benefits of the vaccine, and we're going to work together to fight this pandemic so that we can protect our communities and to protect our food security. Yes. Uh, Madam uh, Vice President, we are committed to be a partner with you. We are honored to be part of this community movement, and thank you for allowing us to participate. I appreciate you having this today, and we can. It's our time <laughs> to make a difference, and we can do this. Oh. Thank you, Zippy. And, you know, our American farms, um, there's been so much food insecurity around our country, and our American farmers have been stepping up in extraordinary ways. You know, to the extent that I've been able to travel in the midst of COVID, I, I, I've been to so many food distribution centers. Um, and what our American farmers have been doing that has been just... Um, uh, just not only courageous about being out there and continuing to, 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 to grow the food supply in our country, but what they've been doing in terms of the donations they've been making um, has yes. really been extraordinary because while they are trying to make it through the month, they've been so generous. And, I, and I'll just take a moment of privilege to also just share with everyone. Um, I went to one food distribution center, and um, the folks who were working there told me that, you know, People would line up in their cars for hours, um, waiting to get to the point where they can receive the, the donation. And what they were finding, what the volunteers were finding is this. A car would pull up, and then because of COVID, there's no physical interaction between the volunteer and, and the occupant of the car. But the occupant of the car, they, they'll pop open their trunk. And the volunteers were finding often that when the trunk opened, there'd be a piece of paper there with handwriting on it, where the occupants of the car wrote notes to the volunteers to thank them. Um, from time to time, the trunk would pop open, and there might be a note and a $5 bill. The occupants of the car who are in a food line, stretched to the limits, but still wanted to give back something. And at the very least, honor the dignity of the work of the volunteers and the, and the farmers and everyone who was contributing to that. There's so much about this pandemic and the crisis that has also shown the grace, you know, and, 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 and what, what 
the beauty and the strength of, of, of human beings and, and, and what I believe is our fundamental nature, to be kind and to be thankful and to, to be a community. Um, so thank you. And, and again, Zippy, thank you for, for, and your members for all that they've been doing. And next. Uh, Madam Vice President, yeah. we, uh, we, we've documented $5.4 million being given by farmers and over a million pounds of food and I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of hours. And a lot of people question whether or not the farmers were going to stay, uh, go back to work when the pandemic hit. Yeah. We started hashtag still farming. It touched over 100 million people, 90 different countries. And we assure the people of America that we're going to be there to make sure that their pantries are full and keep uh, food security for our country. Hashtag still farming. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Zippy. Um, next, Thank it is you. my great honor to introduce Haypin M of our um, Faith and Community Empowerment. Haypin, it's great to see you. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation and for your leadership uh, with uh, Dr. Murphy. I have to say that it is such a change of air uh, with the new administration when you uh, in leadership that there is great hope and I see the tangible changes and the world opening up. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, to this morning, or yes, it's still this morning on both coasts, um, I am here to represent the voices of over uh, 400,000 houses of worship in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. For us, uh, even when the COVID shuts the world down, we are still open. Uh, as you say, the spirit of generosity, service, selflessness yeah. are very much at the core of people uh, of faith. Yeah. And so uh, for many of us, we have been open, uh, providing food, uh, providing uh, medical care, providing the human touch, uh, mm -hmm. even in spite of the danger and the threat of COVID-19. Uh, as an organization from the start, we have been uh, connecting resources uh, to our faith leaders so that they might be able to share with their congregation, whether it's distribution of masks, mm -hmm. uh, where to get the vaccines, vaccine codes. We've been partnering with the governor's office, coordinating all uh, efforts with the mayor's office, with uh, mobility uh, uh, vaccine units uh, and others. And we've been hosting forums, uh, <coughs> sharing again information, the truth, because there's a lot yeah. of misinformation that is spreading. Uh, I've learned such things as that is the, the COVID-19 vaccine is like the mark of the beast. And it's just unbelievable mm -hmm. uh, of that. Um, and so again, mm -hmm. being able to share uh, that communication, we have over 35,000 names in our database of leaders of leaders, including faith organizations, uh, business organizations, community-based organizations, uh, elected officials, and, and such. And so again, um, I think that our voice has been missing um, and uh, in many places, but again, faith organizations are integrated into every sector, every segment uh, of society, geographically, nationally. And I have to say that they really serve as first responders. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were called to ministry. They thought they were going to preach the gospel, save a lot of souls. They did a lot of that, but they, in essence, they ended up becoming unpaid social workers because not just my parents, but mm -hmm. all faith leaders, yeah. people look upon them with trust. They're accessible and they're free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in many ways, um, they are the first uh, people that people go to. But again, more than anything else, it is about trust. Yeah. I also want to say that I'm here today to also be a voice for the Asian American community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one out, uh, I'm sorry, over 20% of doctors in the United States are health, are Asians. Mm -hmm. Almost 10% of the nurses in this country are Asians. Mm -hmm. One out of four are frontline workers or in essential business. Yeah. And yet one of the doctors recently said in a press conference, uh, they are treating us like the virus when we're treating the virus. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, I just want to lift this up uh, use us, uh, leverage us. <laughs> we have the space, we have the volunteers, we have the heart, and we have the trust. And so again, we're here today to partner with you um, and to help spread the good news that the world is coming up, that there is 
a solution uh, for many of us to get back uh, and be part of the world. Thank you, Vice President Kamala Harris. Thank you, Hey Pin, and I uh, really appreciate you mentioning the um, the experience that far too many of our Asian brothers and sisters have been having. Um, you know, we the, from the beginning of this conversation, Dr. Tuxin has a campaign saying, "Make it plain." That means also, in my opinion, keeping it real and speaking yes. truth. Yes. And yes. I appreciate you making that point, and I think we all know as um, a collective, as a coalition, as a community, and as a country, we all need to speak out against the hate where we are seeing it, and we need to remind our fellow human beings that they are not alone, and we will stand together um, wherever and whenever we see that kind of hate being expressed. So thank you, Hey Pin, for bringing that up. Thank you so much. And I do want to point out that I know that uh, the the COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, the Asian community, uh, like in the city of LA in May 2020, had the highest death rate of any group. In New York, recently, um, South Asians and Chinese had the highest positive COVID-19 infections. I'm just giving you a couple of examples. Um, and yet, uh, we are not included in many of the talking points. And I think that leads also to Asian Americans not being able to pay attention uh, because we're not, we're not being talked about on the news, on the talking points, on the PowerPoints. And so I would like to really just advocate uh, the inclusion of Asian Americans in these uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on lives. Um, as well as, of course, the faith organizations. Again, another group that oftentimes uh, get left out in the public discourse. Thank you. Uh, as we are valuable to this country. Thank you. And um, Dr. Murthy knows, because he's been a leader in our administration on this, um, together with Dr. Um, Nunez Smith, uh, it is very important to the president that we speak truth and address racial inequities across the board, but on this topic in particular in our health care system. And again, these disparities existed long before. When we look at the rates of, the, of infection and, and death in the Asian community, in the African American community, Latinos, let's, our Native community, the yes. numbers are, are, are really unacceptable yes. uh, and yes. tragic. And in, in terms of the impact on these communities, of course, profound. And so this is something we have been addressing. We have a racial equity task force that is very much a part of our whole approach to this. And um, in addition, you will often hear the president and all of us talk about the importance of equitable distribution of yes. resources and support. And so to everyone here, and, and again, I'm going to look at the whole group, to everyone here, um, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Um, for your work, for your time, for your leadership, for what you are doing to boost the confidence of the people who need to know again that they're not alone, um, for reminding folks that, that, you know, it is within each person's power to actually make the choice and make the decision to get vaccinated and to, in, in so doing to save their life. Right? It, it, this, it, it's within each individual's power. And I think there's been so much about this pandemic that has isolated people, literally isolated them, but also isolated folks emotionally, making people feel alone. And as we all know, when, when folks feel alone, it, it, can, it can strip them of their sense of their power. And so part of this whole collective and this approach, this community core, is that we know there is power that we give the individual when they see that they are not alone and that we are all in this together as a community. Um, and that is very much at the essence of this whole approach and what we are doing today and what you as founding members are doing. It is about reminding our fellow person of, of their power and that we see them that they matter, and, um, and that we're going to help each other out. So, you know, there's a reason that COVID-19 Community Corps is at the core of our public education campaign. And um, 
and the work each of you is, is doing is going to make a huge difference. You're saving lives, and um, I'll tell you, just as a, a, a housekeeping note, there's going to be a social media toolkit in your inbox now to help you continue your work, and we will be in touch with you with more resources in the day as, days ahead. Um, be in touch with each other. I, everyone can see. I'm sure you see people you know. Let's all be in touch with each other, and we can do this. We can do this. So thank you, and Dr. Murthy, thank you always for your leadership. Thank you all, everyone, and be well. Be well, be well.